Welcome back everybody. We're starting, well I have already started theoretically lecturing on uh, history. I will have started with the prehistoric period before you see this, most of you. But we are now talking about Egypt. And I have also talked about the Mesopotamian world. And so now we move into Egypt. Almost simultaneously we kind of see points on, on the planet that are having the birth of civilizations and Egypt is definitely one of them. All right, and Egypt is important because it has a lot of foundation uh, motifs that continue to influence the Greeks and so the Greeks are the kind of, you know, where we look to for the beginning of uh, modern Western art history. So certainly Egypt is important. So let's look at the map of Egypt here. We're going to begin in the Old Kingdom and so we're going to talk about this upper part here. We are specifically going to look at Saqqara and of course Giza. In the Old Kingdom these are the centers of Egypt and then we'll move down into uh, the New Kingdom and that's centered more here in what's called Upper Egypt. Now that's confusing but that's based on the fact that the Nile runs from the south to the north. It's one of those anomalies in uh, the world. I mean it's just not, it doesn't happen very often although certainly it, ha it happened here in Florida. For those of you who are from here hopefully you know that. Florida is one of the few places that has a river that runs up backwards. It's the called the St. John's. But the uh, Nile is the lifeline of Egypt and still today a very important part of Egyptian daily life. Egyptian culture is conservative and so what you can say about Egyptian culture is that it is relatively unchanging over time. It really does not have that many all you know innovations. Uh, technologically probably vaulting that was being done, vaulting having to do, if you don't remember that lecture on architecture, having to do with the ceiling was really based on forms borrowed from Western Asia. And it's a very impressive period for the massiveness of some of the structures. So let's look at what begins to happen and why we have the emergence of what the Old Kingdom is known for, pyramid building. So initially Egyptians discovered that bodies were becoming almost dehydrated being buried in the arid you know soil of the desert and so they begin to focus on a way to preserve the body and one of the things that they did was they buried them in excuse me elaborate funerary tombs if you were wealthy of course and these tombs were called mastabas there's the word right there Okay, they put a shaft, a sunk a shaft down into the bedrock and the body would be hidden there. Now there was a reason for this and that was because included in the idea of the afterlife and the preservation of the body was the idea of a ka and that's spelled K-A. In Egypt the ka is seen as a energy force, a life force that will never leave. It's always around. It's just associated with certain bodies at certain times. It's hard to translate that into a Western Christian perspective because most people want to use soul, but that word's not exactly right. It does not exactly fit the concept, but the Ka had a period of waiting after the death of the body and during that time period it stayed with its body. That's why the body had to be preserved and it also had to be recognizable. Thus the use of death masks and such like that. And um, it it was entertained if you will by items and foodstuffs and things like that that were left in these tombs. This left the tombs vulnerable to tomb robbers and that's why they began to hide the body. The body itself was so primary and the idea of the mummy becomes so associated with Egypt that it almost becomes its own art form. You can see here what a mummy actually looks like. None of that Hollywood stuff, you know, the, the ones that can walk. This one would only be able to hop. And the body was preserved, the cavities filled with an embalming fluid. All of the organs taken out 
you can see here the process of doing the mummification and they were put and it's right here in these little jars called canopic jars so all of the organs would be preserved and then put into the tomb the body itself would be well preserved if you've ever never seen a mummy it's pretty amazing how well preserved they are and it would be in that you know tomb that you had the ka living and waiting for its next life, if you will. Let's put it that way. I'm trying to keep it simplistic, but Egyptian religion is extremely complex. So let's uh, move forward with that. So we have the body, it has to be buried. And then we have really important people like the old uh, king in the old kingdom. He's one of the earliest kings and his name is Zoser. Zozer is kind of almost the first pharaoh. The evolution of the pharaoh is that uh, the pharaoh is half god, half man, or really all god. If you really get down to it, he says the pharaoh would be the child of the gods. They were descended from the gods. And so to bury them was important to have them buried in a very prestigious place. The earliest architect to attempt to do this that we know of is an architect named Imhotep. Imhotep designed and built for King Zoser or Dijoser, it's another name used, the pyramid at Saqqara. And it's a step pyramid. You can see here the funerary complex. What Imhotep figured out was he had time while building this. It doesn't look like, you know, Giza here. Saqqara looks very different. Someplace I'd really love to go because this is the first real pyramid structure in Egypt uh, because it is a step pyramid. But think of it this way. It's a series of mastabas of descending size stacked one on top of another. Here's how it began. The first mastaba, Imhotep. Again, Imhotep, the architect for Zoser. Imhotep, I M H O. T E P, the first known architect of Egypt. First known architect, essentially, we look at it for Western art history, okay? I mean, we look at him. But he built this big mastaba, and the king was doing well. And as long as the king was alive, you had to keep working on his tomb. That was a part of the deal. And so he enlarged it. There's the second session, sections. And then he enlarges it again. He sinks the first shaft down for burial. And then he does things, another one down. All of this is done to try to avoid the, the tomb being robbed, all right? As Zoser kept thriving, what Imhotep came up with was this idea of, all right, let's go up. And he starts stacking these mastaba forms, one on top of another, eventually enlarging even that. And then adding here for balance, this little piece on the front as well. Uh, this is made from mud, uh, brick work, okay? It's not a large stone. These are stone too, but not like the pyramids in Giza, all right? Giza are the ones you think of when I say pyramids. I know all of you, when I say pyramids, that's what you think of. But this is really a step pyramid. And there it is. Very important as it begins the building of pyramids in Egypt. So don't forget Imhotep and his structure at Saqqara, the step pyramid of Zoser or Dijoser. Inside you can see the rough interior where they say this is where they sunk that shaft down. And here you can see how absolutely, I mean, the construction in these places is so mathematically right on. Look at that. Perfect right angle in one of the corridors. And there's that shaft again. You can see the brickwork. You can see the stone cutting. In the inside, we have a temple dedicated to Zoser. There's desert turquoise. And you can see this large relief image of the idea of the king striding in Egypt. And remember hierarchic proportion. All right, what's what we're looking at, this big large figure of the king. What's also found at Saqqara is a serdap, S-E-R-D-A-P. Uh, this is a Ka statue and it's an image of the king. One of the few things left there. There it is. 
very bad condition the years have kind of worn it away but you can see here an example of early Egyptian sculpture Egyptian sculpture <coughs> excuse me doesn't change much it's very like I said very conservative in art history and we have these very big blocky pieces that are engaged to the block they're never freestanding they're very frontal Although the face would have been quite realistic. Because remember the Ka, well the Ka had to recognize the statues of its, you know, this is a Ka statue. It's to help it find its way to its body to rest. From Imhotep's uh, initial step pyramid, we see the eventual emergence of the Great Pyramids of Giza. The Pyramids of Giza are very famous. Uh, in fact, the Great Pyramid, the biggest one, was the largest structure for thousands of years in the world. And the largest one is not this one. Everyone thinks it is. It's actually this one. All right. Three kings it was built for were Khufu, his son Khafre, and Khafre's son Mankare. All right. They were built to preserve the bodies of the pharaohs. That's what their purpose is. Main number one purpose. Did they, you know, fulfill their duty? No. That's one thing you can say about the pyramids. They failed. They were too big. Too big. I mean, look at this thing. The Great Pyramid. Khufu's Great Pyramid. It's enormous. If I read you the dimensions, it covers 13 acres contains 2,300,000 blocks of limestone, which averages two and a half tons each, each stone a piece. Imagine that. It was surrounded by wooden boats and pits and had three smaller pyramids near it for his immediate family and a mastaba for his mother. It's just amazing. It's a complex. His queens are here. It's just an enormous complex and of course the sphinx here guarding it now that's the great pyramid right there all right if i show you an image of it taken from space you can clearly see them the pyramids they clearly stand out and here get, giving you an idea of the scale of the pyramid there's someone standing right there this is the, at the great pyramid now it would have been covered with a white limestone facing and a, it would have had a gold capstone. This is Khafre's uh, pyramid, Khufu's son. There's the blow up of the people who are standing there. Look at that thing. These are enormous buildings, people. These are not small structures. Enormous amounts of work with no wheels uh, being functional in sand. You guys know that wheels don't really work that well in the sand. And if you from from Florida, you know this. You ever tried to pull something across the sand? They use sleds and they pilled the blocks along and then pulled them up a ramp laying them in different it's called courses all right you do one row that's called a course and going up from there and capping it all off at the top with a gold capstone which disappeared okay someone asked me that it's like it's been gone for about uh, over a thousand years you can see here the three pyramids of the queens and you can see where those pits were. See that? Those were boat pits. Khufu's boats were put in there. And this is one that's actually been recovered. Isn't that cool? Just think of how old that thing is. Uh, they, 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 you know, the pharaohs enjoyed life. And so obviously this was for his Ka to go out, hey, do a little fishing, do a little hunting, you know, the, all the things that the kings enjoyed doing, or excuse me, the pharaohs. Because remember, the pharaoh is a more of a concept of he's also a god. You can see here today the new museum. This has since opened up and I'm dying to go. Unfortunately, the coronavirus not only uh, canceled my trip to Ireland this year, it's also delayed my trip to Egypt. I was going to go in 2021 because I'm dying to see the new museum. Uh, but I will eventually. Uh, at Giza, the site, <coughs> excuse me, most bodies, the king's bodies were bought here by water and then unloaded and taken up to the pharaoh's pyramid once the pharaoh was deceased. Um, this pyramid took about 20 years to complete. 
uh, they had over 100,000 workers working here during that period. Scholars today have uh, come up and, uh, and, and mostly agree with the idea that most of the workers here were conscripted workers. They came from villages and they worked here during the time of flood, when the now I would flood. The farmers couldn't farm, so they were commanded to give over workers so many young men from the village. Although some of these were professionals. The idea that they were all slaves has been disputed and I think overturned by looking at the workers, the excavations done on workers' tombs. Here, in the Great Pyramid, instead of going down, the shaft being sunk down into the bedrock, they actually went into the pyramid. And the king's chamber here is where the sarcophagus of Khufu would have been. This is the queen's chamber, and there was a subterranean chamber as well. But this is where it seems they, like the builders changed their mind and they put the king's body in here. Was it successfully hidden? No. As I said in the beginning of discussion of Giza, these are failures. Unfortunately, they're so beautiful you want them to be, you know, impregnable, but uh, they're looted within the first hundred years of their construction. All that's left of the Khufu's treasure, and we can't even imagine how much is in there. I mean, we can't. It just blows our mind thinking about it, scholars is a sarcophagus. You can see it was broken by the tomb robbers when they pried the lid of the sarcophagus and this small statue was recovered as well. They must have missed it. Khafre's pyramid here retained some of its limestone facing on the top there. You can see it. And there you see one of the corridors, and corridors inside. The pyramids you can go inside. And Mankari has his Ka statue here. Oh no, yes. Yeah, this is Khafre, so sorry. This is his Ka statue. So you can actually get an idea of what he looked like. Notice this sculpture is engaged to the block. Like I said, it's very frontal and very blocky. And also notice his little beard here. Uh, these were fake most of the time. These were little uh, fake beards that were put on. Most of these uh, pharaohs had all their hair taken off their body to avoid bugs. You know, it's kind of a fascinating idea, but... Hey, when you have a lot of bugs, that's what you do. And there's Moncari and his sister wife. And some of you are going, what? Yeah, the pharaohs, because they were gods, they had trouble finding people who were gods to marry. So they married within their own immediate family. And you can see quite clearly here. See that family resemblance? Look around the ears and the nose. You see it. They're quite beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful material. The basalt, very blocky though, still engaged, not freestanding. These are not considered freestanding, but still a very beautiful image. On the interior of the pyramid, they also painted images telling stories about the pharaoh and the pharaoh's rule. Notice the view. We get the profile view of the face, but the frontal view of the aisle. eye. Excuse me. And then we have the frontal view of the torso. And then the profile view from the waist down, uh, profile view of the feet. This is not because they didn't know how to paint. They did. It's just a convention in how they did portray images of humans. The and frontal view of the eye was very important. All right, but they are very beautiful. It's very detailed. Look at the little crocodile down here. Isn't that lovely? Uh, notice the hierarchic scale. You know, the pharaoh's large as he clubs these egrets. <laughs> kind of gruesome. Uh, the helper's very small, but still a very beautiful palette on this one. And then you see daily scenes, too. They showed different things happening. And the flora and the fauna of the region. The largest statue on the plateau, the Giza Plateau, is the one of the Sphinx. Sphinx. S-P-H-I-N-X. And the Sphinx is half man, um, the head of a man and the body of a lion. He's in terrible condition. He's gone un undergone a number of really poor restorations. Uh, there was a myth that Napoleon's soldiers, when they invaded Egypt, shot the nose off with a cannon. 
<coughs> it's not true. And that's been disproven. Uh, but it's he's poor the sport poor sphinx. He needs a little help. There's other sphinxes I just wanted to make that clear in Egypt, but that's the famous one because he guards the plateau at Giza. From here we're going to move into the New Kingdom. I'm skipping the old the middle kingdom and just going right to the new kingdom because of expediency for time, so that'll be part two of this lecture. Okay, this is uh, another portion of the lecture on Egypt, and we're starting with the New Kingdom here. The New Kingdom, the focus of Egypt's rulers, moves south, and we particularly see an emphasis on Luxor and Thebes later on. The part of the New Kingdom that's so famous is the discovery of Tut in the Valley of the Kings, but let's begin by looking at new architectural forms that rose up. Uh, in the New Kingdom, the power of the Pharaoh had waned, and so the priest class had risen up, and so they began to build large temple complexes. Uh, this is called a hypostyle hall, H-Y-P-O, S-T-Y-L-E, and these were the main temples for primary gods like uh, Amun, the god of the sun, Ra, the god of the sun, Amun, Ra. You can see here one of the big problems the Egyptians had with vaulting. They never developed ability to have large interior spaces. Well, and I, I, I address that in the architectural lecture. It's the dependence on columns as a flat roof support. Uh, you have to have something like the Romans did, uh, which we'll eventually get to, but we're not there yet. Uh, but you can see that it's not meant to be used for large gatherings in the interior. Instead, it was to be meant to be viewed from the outside. These large temples, they're enormous. I'll show one with people in it. Have these huge, gigantic lotus columns. Uh, again, um, you know, one thing about Egypt, while it's kind of passive, the architecture, it's, it, it is immutable. It doesn't change. It's a massive. It'll be there, you feel like, for another, you know, 3,000 years, no problem. Uh, and in the New Kingdom, we have some of the more well-known pharaohs. Uh, you you all uh, know some of them, Tut's being the most obvious, but let's talk about one that maybe she's not so well known, but I think she is just as important, and her name was Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was the first female pharaoh. Uh, she was quite ambitious. <laughs> she took the throne of Egypt from her husband and half-brother Tutmos II and ruled for 20 years. All right, her brother was, uh, her half-brother actually, Tutmosis II, inherited the throne. And Hatshepsut had always felt that he was an inept ruler. And so she, let me show an image of her, here she is, uh, decided to, you know, take matters into her own hands, some people speculate. Although this is not proven, I'm just telling you a story right now, but it is interesting. Because her brother died mysteriously after a fall. Maybe not a fall, maybe a push, but we don't know. But it is interesting again. <coughs> and Hatshepsut took the throne and ruled while her brother's child, her nephew, was uh, young. And that was Tutmos the, the third. Her father was Tutmos the first, brother Tutmos the second, his son Tutmos the third. Today, she's seen as one of the most important figures in archaeology, in the Egyptian archaeology, because they have recently, in the last 10 years, discovered her mummy. Here it is. Hatshepsut was a tiny woman, five foot two, and quite large. Uh, and see here that that mummy is so amazingly well preserved. We even see the hair on her hair coloring, the reddish hair. It was, it was very popular to color your hair red with henna. Her temple was built by her architect, her royal architect named Senmut, S-E-N-M-U-T. She promoted him to the chief of the royal works. They said she even may have had a couple children for him, so he was quite favored by her. 
in that it went way over the price he originally figured eight times uh, that's what the, the amount has been but it was based on a form that had been developed as a landscaped terraced architecture it's called earlier in the middle kingdom so this is the second temple we see this way and tomb again very different from the pyramid pyramid building was only popular during the old kingdom that's it it doesn't really carry over and that's because like i said it failed but you walk up here in a series of terraces and on the inside the story of Hatshepsut was told even though her nephew stepson tried to erase her she still endured through time especially in her obelisk form. Notice that. That's an obelisk. That's a weird word here. But you all know this form. The Washington Memorial. You know, look at the top here is a pyramid. Do you ever wonder why uh, the Washington Memorial's ship, you know, like this? Why? Why is on the dollar bill, <coughs> if you've never looked at one, George, you know, George Washington, why is it a pyramid with the all-seeing eye there? What well, starts, you know, stands for the Masonic Lodge. Washington was a member. He was a Mason. And so we see these Egyptian forms being adopted. It's kind of interesting because it links back to the idea that the first builders were the Egyptians. That's where it comes from. And the Masons come out of the Masonry. They're builders. All right. So, but onward to the most famous of the New Kingdom pharaohs. It was definitely... Tut. Tut was a very young man. I mean, he's just not that important in his own day. It's sad. He has a sad story. Uh, he was uh, between the ages of 19 and 21 when he died. He died quite young. He took the throne very young, between the ages of 8 and 12. He was married. He was quite frail. Tut had and so many problems and of course many of them were due to inbreeding uh, but the thing that probably killed him besides his own frailty is a very small frail I've read um, instances where they um, estimate about 96 97 pounds at the time of his death was he, he actually fell from a chariot and broke his leg and they do believe that led to sepsis and that him dying but certainly images of Tut and ideas of Tut abound in popular culture and here you see his death mouth notice his mouth here notice also, also he likes to wear makeup you know makeup was worn by men first keep the sun out of your eyes it's the same reason football players use black grease paint underneath their eyes. Man wore it first. Here he is. This is an approximation. Of, this is a computer generated image, of course. And you can see here, uh, notice his mouth. Uh, he had a cleft palate. And uh, one of the things they determined was he would have been bar barely able to speak. He wasn't a very powerful pharaoh. You know what makes him remembered, though? Is when he was discovered by Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon in 1922. It was the first fully intact pharaoh's tomb ever discovered. Carter was the money man. Excuse me, Carnarvon. Sorry, I'm looking at the pictures thinking of something else. He had money and he backed Carter, the archaeologist, and they found the tomb. And when they opened it, they could not believe what they saw. All the other tombs had been robbed. Ramsey's body was found. He was actually found. Very few bodies are found. Nothing much is left of these tombs. They're all pillaged. But in here, it was full of treasure. And there's a recreation of it in, the, in a museum. All right. It had his thrones, his, it had food for him, it has his favorite, you know, sandals, uh, two Nubian guards carved at the entranceway. The tomb was still sealed, although it appears it was broken into at some point in its history. And here is Carter examining the body. One of the things that most people have said about Tut was, here it is, and, you know, it's kept very carefully because it's in very poor shape. All the things from Tut's uh, tomb are, are guarded carefully because of, first of all, the stuff was out, sent out of the country quite a bit, some of it damaged, but also Carter, when he took uh, the body out, he dropped it and it was damaged and so the mummy is in very poor condition. Here's Carter preparing some of the things for shipping. 
and you get to see some of the beauty of Egyptian work. I mean, they're just amazing. <clears throat> I went and I saw the Tut show. It traveled here to Fort Lauderdale in, in South Florida. It's the last time they let any of his artifacts out. It's not his body. He's never let go. And even his uh, death mask isn't allowed out. But it's beautiful stuff. The detail and the inlay. This is uh, lapis lazuli. It's a semi-precious stone. And it's on gold. This was on, a, on the side of a chest. You can see here Tut and his young wife. And a perfume bottle. And this was from a handle from a mirror. And one of his crowns. His summer throne. This was actually when I was in the museum. I took this picture. His favorite chariot. Tut did like to hunt. And so we see that here. And then of course. Sawi Hawass. The uh, curator of the. Egyptian Museum of Antiquities. Here he is. He allowed a CT scan of the body in 2005. And you can see here. In how frail this mummy is. It's very frail. Comparatively speaking, there's some ones out there that are very in very good shape. It depends on how much contact they've had with outside air and people. Uh, probably one of some of the worst things that happen to them are they get infections from bacteria, from modern bacteria. They can't handle these mummies. And so here you see his uh, little poor little body. Um, he had a club foot too. He had difficulty walking and speaking. Plus they think he had endemic man malaria. Uh, he had a, a bunch of issues. It's not surprising he didn't live to be very old. And uh, it's a tragic ending to his short life. But he lives on because of the discovery of all the stuff and all the work. Look at those CT scan on the brain and everything. Everything that shows Tut's you know, in the remnants of Tut. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you all later.